It's a project set up uh, for the Murray-Darling Basin Authority to monitor the effects of Dartmouth Dam on the biological health of the Mittermitter River downstream of uh, Dartmouth Dam. It's now been extended to above uh, Dartmouth as well to look at land use impacts, but predominantly is to look at the effects of Dartmouth Dam on the ecology of the Mitter River. The objectives were for the Mitter Monitoring Project to assess how the Mitter River responded to the building of Dartmouth Dam and the flow releases from Dartmouth Dam. Uh, we look at the macroinvertebrate community to assess the biological health of the system. So if they were to change the way they operate the dam, we may be able to detect whether that's having a positive or a negative impact on the ecology of the river. This project has 16 sites all up. Um, nine of them are above Dartmouth and the other seven below. We sampled several sites down the main channel all the way down to Talon Dune before it flows into uh, Lake Hume. There are also seven tributary sites that we sample. Some of them are uh, pristine and we use as a reference condition and some are sort of impacted by various land use practices. Macroinvertebrates, they are a, um, a group of predominantly aquatic insects which have a larval stage in, in the water. Uh, it also includes shrimp and yabbies. Uh, but they're important because they're a link between the algal growth and the, the fish. They're a link in the food chain and they have a diverse range of habitat requirements and water quality requirements which make them ideal for monitoring biological health because they will respond in terms of their, the species that live there and the, their abundances will be determined by the quality of the habitat and water in the river. So we can use them to assess how healthy the river is and how it is responding to the river uh, changes from Dartmouth. So out in the field here, when we're sampling, we take two macroinvertebrate samples, one's from the edge and one's from the riffle. We'll take them both with just in nets. Uh, the edge sample, those, those bugs will generally come from uh, slower flowing environments uh, in the vegetation um, and in, in the edge habitat. And then the riffle sample is generally from the middle of the stream and we'll be kicking around in the cobbles and boulders there, dislodging the bugs which then flow into the net. Um, and what we're trying to do is, is, is turn the boulders over because many of the animals we're after are living on the un underside of the boulders and down in the substrate, as well as across the top of the boulders. So by kicking them and disturbing them, they displace and then go into the net. After we take those samples, we put them into a sorting tray and we pick them live out of that for about half an hour to an hour. We spend pulling the bugs out live and we preserve them and take them back to the lab. So I've just gone down to the creek here and picked up a, an edge sample um, and I've brought that back to the table and I'm just sorting through, picking out as many families of um, bugs that I can find in the, in the sample. So I've got a, uh, a kick sample here and Michael's got an edge sample. Uh, so now we're just sorting, sorting through the samples here in the trays and picking out as many different families as we can. So the methods we're using here are uh, Oz Rivers methods, which were set up as a rapid bioassessment to um, assess river health. We pick for half an hour, trying to get as many different families as we can. And then if we get any new animals in the 10 minutes after that half an hour, uh, we continue going final cutoffs an hour, so with the main aim to get as many different types of animals as possible within that time frame. We use that data to put into some modelling uh, which then sort of rates the sites as in reference condition or slightly impaired or severely impaired according to the Oz Rivers modelling system. Into the future there's a few tools being developed now where we can go to a site like this um, grab a, a water sample and extract from that uh, dissolved or free DNA, environmental DNA, and we can generate a species list of what's occurring in the, the creek just from that water sample. So that's, um, that's into the future. Macroinvertebrates perform numerous roles uh, in these river systems. There's the grazers, which graze on the algae off the rocks. There's the shredders, which uh, process the leaf litter. 
There's the filter feeders, which capture uh, nutrients and food floating downstream, and the predators, which eat the other macroinvertebrates. So they're feeding on one another. They also provide food for larger animals, fish, um, and, and they're breaking down um, inputs to the river. So you're getting coarse leaf and bark and organic material coming into the river. Some of these animals are chewing them up and it, it becoming part of the food web, um, assimilating those nutrients into the system. It gives you a bit of an insight as to what many or well, most of our rivers might have looked like before human settlement. It also shows you how things can, can go backward pretty easily by the way we manage our, our rivers and manage our land around the rivers as well. The Midder River, once since they built Dartmouth Dam, has been quite severely affected by the operation of the dam. And with all of the changes in flow regime which they've tried to implement to improve the river health, the biological health of the river has remained pretty much the same ever since the dam has been built. We know this because we know what the communities were like before the dam was built, we have tributary streams which we use as references and the sites directly above the dam have a much more diverse macroinvertebrate community which is responding to climate changes that have been occurring over the last few years, whereas the Midder River has remained in that impacted state.